Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our MOOC this evening. So this MOOC tonight is all about tech careers with GFK. Backstage, you have me, Aileen. I am a Code for Skills brand ambassador. So if you have any questions about Code for Skills or other upcoming classes and events, please, please feel free to message me. Um, I'm currently a delivery manager in FinTech. I studied and worked as a chemical engineer in the energy industry for around three and a half years before deciding to do a pivot to tech. Um, so I worked with Code First Girls during university and joined their courses during the first lockdown, which helped me spin off into tech, basically. So tonight we're really excited to have a fantastic team from GFK. We'll have Q&A at the end. So please do send your questions into the YouTube chat um, and we'll get to ask the panel. So I'm just going to add them all into the stream so you can just say hello to everybody. Um, so we have Maddie, a business analyst. We have John Eves, uh, Information Security Manager. Um, we have Giovanna, a Scrum Master. We have Avina, a Front End Software Engineer. And we have Lisa, a Data Scientist. Thanks guys for joining us. Really excited to hear what you guys have to say. Um, and just to let the audience know as well, this YouTube video will be up for a week or two after the session today. So you can always come back to rewatch it if you would like. Um, so, right, so let's get started. So I'm going to hand over to you, Maddie, to kick us off. Thank and I'll you. Take everybody else off the stream. And I will add the slides for you. All right, mm. Maddie, when you're ready, go for it. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. It's really, really nice to speak to you this evening. Everyone at GFK, we're really excited to talk to you today. Um, so I'm going to start as a business analyst. I'm going to kick off. And I'll just jump to my first slide. So I'll tell you a little bit about me. My uh, title is a junior technical business analyst. I am 24 years old. Right now I'm living between London and Hertfordshire. I just bought my first house, which is really exciting. And uh, originally I come from Doncaster, which is a very, very small town in South Yorkshire. If anyone is from Yorkshire, then send me a message. Um, I studied at King's College London uh, doing a history degree, which shows I'm slightly off path from where I originally intended to be. And at A-level, I studied uh, much of your humanities. So, so no technical things, no IT, no maths, all English, law and history. Perfect. So my career timeline, we start at the very beginning in 2016 when I moved to London to start studying. And then what I had is a period between 2017 and 2019 where I was working in retail. So I was doing my history degree, but I wasn't really doing anything outside of that. I didn't do any internships. I didn't do any work experience. For me, I because I was living in London, I really needed to make an income rather than work on my, my career in terms of what I wanted to do in the future. So I went into retail, which was fun for me. I did work in Harrods and Selfridges. So, um, so it was some really interesting bits. Uh, next up is when I graduated in 2018. So I just did a three-year degree. I didn't take a gap year. I didn't do any placements. I just went and did my straight three years. Then in March 2019, I joined GFK as an office administrator. So the time between my graduation, which was in the summer, it took me around eight months to start applying for jobs. Um, I was a little bit hesitant because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't know if history was the way down. I was just sort of looking at the market, looking at grad schemes that were available. And I just wasn't quite finding anything that I thought was, was certainly the path that I wanted to go down. So I actually joined as an office administrator. I did um, jobs like setting up people's office passes. I used to run some events. It's a very non-technical role. And then if we jump to the next one, you'll see quite quickly after that, so just six months, I was promoted to a project analyst. So some of the work that I did as an office administrator, I was able to show some skills and my manager, who's an incredible woman, uh, spotted in me that uh, maybe office administration wasn't for me. And when she gave me a task, I was able to use some of the skills I'm gonna talk about later and, and start carving out a career path for me, doing a lot of analysis and kind of understanding how projects work and how we can streamline things. Then following September, uh, a year later, I got another promotion. So then I was promoted to a business analyst, which is slightly different to a project analyst, but I was put on specific projects to deliver recommendations and business cases. So for me, it was another step up. So 
I was really happy to say that essentially within a year and a half, I had had two promotions at GFK. Then we go to 2021, which is actually the first time that I got qualified in anything technical uh, in my career. So it was a BCS, it's a diploma, and it was a three-day course. It was a, a moderated exam. It was the first time that I'd ever, ever had to study for anything outside of university, which was a bit scary for me, uh, but I'm really glad that I did it. And I've left 2022 there because I'm currently in a position, very fortunately again, um, to be looking at a new role within GFK. And I think it speaks volumes personally for me about the company because I have got several offers from different areas of the business that have managed to see my growth from being an office administrator and now being able to do some technical development work in projects. And GFK is a, is a company where uh, if they see talent, they most definitely will speak up and say, oh, I have an opportunity for you here. I have an opportunity for you here. And I've really, really benefited, benefited from that in my career at GFK. So I'm in a nice spot where I've got um, a few options that I get to talk through with my manager and decide what's best for me. So if you haven't heard of business analysis before, it's probably one of the vaguest um, and least clear jobs that go in the tech industry. So I picked this definition, which is called, which is saying assessing and facilitating change within an organization. So we put forward recommendations. We make sure that whoever's asked for this change is happy with the outcome that they've got at the end of the year. So you can say that it's a very hard job because people naturally don't like change. And you'll find that within any career in any industry is that change is never, never received well because change is scary. People tend to dig their heels in and fight it. And so when you're in a business analyst role, as you can see, the skills are up here. You really, really need to be very strong minded. You need to know your facts. You need to be able to research and, and really focus on what it is that you're delivering and always understanding where value is. So I've added some other ones, adaptable. If you're somebody that can think quite quickly on your feet and you know somebody throws you a problem and you think, okay, no, that's fine. Let's just rework it. Especially if you're in an agile environment, you'll probably be a lot more used to this. But in business analysis, you really need to be able to take on feedback and listen to what people say and rework things. Another one is the ability to question. So always, always finding the why and why somebody said this. So I have an example later on, but a really, really good example is somebody tells you a problem. And as a business analyst, you need to know whether or not they're giving you a problem or a symptom of a problem. So a really easy way to explain it is if somebody says to you, I need a new system because it's really slow, a, you could hear that and think, okay, then the problem is that the system is slow, but that's not the problem necessarily. That could be a symptom. What the problem is, is that maybe you're loading too much data into the system and that's why it's slowing it down. So when you're doing work like this, you really need to be able to, to pry at every single piece of information that somebody's giving you. Make sure that you've got a good relationship with them. Make sure that you're finding time to talk to them as well. That timekeeping is a huge deal. And, and really, really getting down into the root cause of the problem, and not just looking at the symptoms at a surface level. So what I've done, instead of telling you too much about what a business analyst role is, I'm going to give you a brief in which what I would receive while I'm working to show you what sort of things that we have to go through as a business analyst. So here's a brief. So imagine HR have come to you and said, OK, I've got some employee data in the system and it's and I really, really want to see it. You know, it's really important data. Right now, we've got it in Excel and no one, not many people can access it. There we go. We've got some huge issues. So we've got data. People can't access them. Another issue that's on the end says that people have made multiple changes to the file. So we've got multiple versions. And if you work in IT at all or you, you are used to Excel, versioning control is a big issue. It's something that will crop up quite often. So this is what's come to me as a business analyst. So what I will do immediately is look at the background and the scope. So I'm going to start asking all these questions. So what are they using? What current issues have they got? Why are they using the issue? Why are they using the system that they've got as well? And again, legal requirements like GDPR. What, what security do we need around this data, which Johnny can probably talk to you a bit more later. And again, like, is there any data in the system that we should not include? So what's the scope of this project that you're asking me to do? 
And then what is the exciting bit for me personally is when you get to elicit your requirements. So you've found all this data, you've got the background, you know what you're being asked to do. So you need to now go out to your stakeholders and you really need to start finding out those problems at the root cause. So you'll do interviews, you'll get people into one-on-ones, you're asking them questions, you're making sure that you understand that they're heard because that's a really important thing is people need to be heard and don't just take the loudest voices in the room, also take the quietest ones because sometimes they're the people with the most knowledge. We run workshops, they can be huge, they can be virtual or in person, you know, using Miro boards and sticky notes. So you can really get creative when you're doing workshops. Another one is shadowing. So you're just essentially following someone around for the day. Um, You're watching them perform tasks that you need to look at. So in this example, you could follow somebody in HR that's exporting those reports. So you can understand what steps they need to go through so you can see where you need to improve. And the last one is prototypes, which is a big thing if you, especially if you want to get into more technical work, is actually building out the way things look before you give it to a developer or before you give it to a stakeholder. So as a business analyst, you're allowed to take all of this information you've found, put it into a wireframe is what we call them. And it could just be a fake website. You can draw it by hand. You can get into a workshop and everybody draw it on a big whiteboard, what you think it should look like and how you think it should act. So if I wanted to build a report, I could build up a dummy report with data in it that doesn't work and show it to somebody and say, hey, what do you think of this? Before we go too far down the line, is this what we're after? So there's lots to do in this section. So in the brief that I've given you about HR saying that we've got problems with Excel and we want people to access it, what I would do next is come up with some solutions. So I've spoken to everyone, I understand what the problem is, and I would do At this bottom, as you can see, I would do some analysis and base it on recommendations. So I would look at at least three products and say, okay, Looker, which is a Google product, came out higher on maybe technical score, but lower on usability. It's really hard to use. Power BI was a clear winner. And then Tableau was maybe in the middle. And so I need to go through and have a look at all of these possible solutions and then put this forward. And what I've shown you here is what essentially is the solution. So I've told my stakeholder that Power BI was the best one. And I've shown them all of the requirements and all the people I've spoken to. And then what I've done is built this. So this took me about 10 minutes to build, just use some fake data. But if HR then said, okay, so how have you solved my problem? I can show them this and say, look, loads of people can access Power BI. This has versioning control. So everybody's seen the same data. And if they want to make changes, they can take it offline and we can update master data. So as long as we've got master data, we're not having any problems with versioning. And so as my as a business analyst, this is the output of, of my case. So I'm taking it back. And what I want to do is immediately get feedback. If somebody says, no, that's really not what I envisioned it to look like. I can go back to all those other solutions I was looking at and try that. So this is called a proof of concept. They're really, really important and they're done very often to find out whether or not your solution works and whether it can be scaled as well. So that was a very brief and very quick introduction to business analysts work. Um, So I hope you can take away from today that from my career, you can see I do technical work at GFK, but I'm not coming from a technical background. And so, A really strong thing to understand is don't worry if you feel like you're not strongest on your technical skills. You can can take courses, you can use Code First Girls to keep improving. And if you find a good company like GFK, they can help you get trained as well. It's really important to make sure that you, you trust in the process and don't not apply for things just because you might not have as much technical knowledge. Another thing is progression takes time. Again, you've seen with my career, I have started in an administration role and managed to move up several times and it's it's really important to just to just trust the process and allow yourself to move through the levels go from junior to a fully fledged and then you know you've got senior and principal above that but don't don't be too hard on yourself and the last point I'd like to make is that business analysis is vague um, very vague so it can take you down some really incredible paths like down software development routes you can go into product management Um, So it's definitely a channel that I would suggest everybody has a look at. 
And so, yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you found anything I've said interesting or you've got any questions. Um, networking is a big way to make good steps in your career. So um, when there's help, I would definitely suggest that everybody has a look and tries to increase their network. So I think I am handing over to jean -Yves. What this slide is, is just some resources if they're shared at the end, uh, just of things that I found helpful throughout my career. So thank you. Well, thanks, Maddie. And um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Maddie introduced me, uh, I am Jean-Yves Le Breton. I'm an information safety manager here at GFK. Uh, and it, it's a real pleasure to, to, to be speaking with you guys because um, I'm, like, like Maddie, my career was not uh, automatically taking me into tech uh, in the first place. I've got a fairly uh, unconventional background. And um, I think a lot of people in information security do have similar backgrounds. Um, so yeah, if we move to the next slide. So I joined GFK as a regular IT security analyst about three and a half years ago. Um, and I'm not a tech person. I'm, uh, I still don't consider myself to this day after many years in, in the tech industry, uh, a techie or nerd. Um, uh, my background was economics. So I got a degree in economics, moved to the UK back in the day in 2003. And um, the most technical tool I would use at the time was Word and Excel. Um, and after a couple of years working, doing different data analysis and economics jobs, I became a software tester by accident, literally, uh, as I was working on a system that kept on crashing. And the developers uh, came to me saying, and my team saying, well, this can't happen. This tool costs a lot of money. Uh, we need to understand why this is, um, this is breaking. So they gathered, gathered all us all of us into a room, uh, gave us some test scripts, and out of a team of eight people, I was still the one uh, crushing everything. So the developers came to my desk, say, show us what you're doing. Uh, and I said, yeah, I'm doing step one, step two, and step three, everything crashes. And they, they kind of came to me, but that's not on the script. I said, well, that's what I need to do to get my job done. So from that point onwards, they came on to, coming to me uh, for advice. And after a few months, my job title, title suddenly changed to software tester. Uh, so I didn't quite think too much about it. I thought, that's pretty cool. Uh, let's carry on. Uh, and that was about now 12 years ago. So for a few years, I worked among development teams as a software tester, often the least technical person on the team. And I kept on finding new issues, new interesting behaviors that need to be fixing. And uh, I came to a point where the most interesting test cases started becoming really, really tricky. And um, as I started doing more research, realizing that they had some safety implications. Uh, so that's where I started uh, finding actual safety bugs. Um, yeah, and so about six years ago, I changed job and um, there was this team of near shore safety testers that need management. And my manager at the time thought, well, you do those weird things can you um, look after them a bit and from that point onwards that's really when i started going to security more and more and formalizing my knowledge but since then i've kept on just learning new things and always feeling like i'm i'm developing and since joining gfk since march i've been actually managing the product security team and which is now a team of seven uh, soon to be eight people so i've, I've been really able to grow into um, into this role uh, uh, throughout my time at GFK. Um, so having spoken about myself, I think uh, I'd like to tell you a bit more what we're actually doing at GFK. And there's really two things we, we are looking at uh, as information security people. The first one, and it's probably the, the most obvious one to me, but it's not mentally very obvious, is trying to keep GFK out of the news, trying to protect the organization so we don't make um, the news for the wrong reasons. Um, information security and or cyber, as it's often um, uh, spoken to in, um, in, um, in the media, has become very, very weaponized and very organized. So a lot of uh, malicious people actually now uh, and gangs actually uh, trying to break into companies to hold them to ransom, uh, to steal the data, selling it to the to the, the highest bidder, or encrypt company systems. Um, and that particular slide was taken by uh, was produced by my manager uh, as I joined the company. If anything that's changed since, I think this is the amount of the ransoms they've just 
gone from hundreds of millions to now billions of dollars or euros. So it is it is really big business. And um, in order to protect uh, the companies, we have to we always on the lookout. We have a, a security operation center that keeps on looking at our alerting and monitoring systems. Uh, we put in place um, technical controls such as um, web application firewalls, um, um, intrusion detection systems to really keep track on what's going on uh, and make sure that uh, we are ready to respond should be anything untowards happen uh, to the company. Um, yeah, so if we go to the next slide, the second thing, and this is where my proxy team uh, come into play, is really actually helping developers and product teams build better products and applications at GFK. Um, having been a software tester for such a long time, I think I've, I've done a lot of quality assurance and quality control, and security is just part of quality assurance. It's just one of those functional requirements we need to look into. Sometimes I know it can be separate, siloed, but actually this is part of one one big whole um, um yeah so we need to take this holistic approach so I, I like to tell my developers or the teams i work with uh that we scare because we care um uh we do hack for a living and um uh, to me hacking is going back to uh this definition of mine which comes from mit which is about um discovering interesting on unexpected behavior in systems so that's what we're trying to do is trying to um run security assessments against all our different uh, products and software and try to highlight any potentially strange behavior that um, that could actually be exploited by any malicious parties and work with the teams to help them uh, fix them and remediate them before we uh, deploy those um, products uh, to production. Whilst this can be quite technical, one of the things we need to do is we need to also be able to explain the risk um, and provide recommendations in uh, plain uh, plain English. So we need to effectively be able to uh, communicate at the right level to different stakeholder groups. So sometimes it can be developers, they like uh, to talk technical, but we also need to talk to business owners, actually tell them in business terms what this is gonna mean. So we have a very broad reach when it comes to talking to different people within the organization, which makes the job extremely interesting. Then to, to help developers, to empower them, uh, the, what we've been really trying to do more and more over the past uh, couple of years is actually provide them directly with the tools that uh, will help them find security issues before even we look, we look at the system. So they can find those issues early and actually take proactive actions. So, and all we have to do effectively support them and then coming to my next point is really educating our community of users to ensure that they understand what um, what they're up against and understand the the, uh, the the knowledge and the skill set there and foster the development of their skill set so they can actually do as as good as as good a job as they can and again on the right hand side um, this is a slide from one of our uh developer workshops when we actually teach people how uh, or developers how they can become hackers themselves to uh effectively be able to find those issues themselves and um and this particular issue is a sql injection which is a very common still very common uh, issue in web application that could actually lead to critical uh, data leakage so i'm already coming to my next slide my last slides um i think what's so great to work about um, in information security and at GFK in particular is one of the things is information security is really complex. It changes all the time. I feel like I have to retrain every six months. And it's really not about how much you know, but how you explore and how you learn and having the right attitude to solve puzzles, uh, business puzzles. Um, so I think that's one of the things I've, I've, I've noticed in all new people who come into information security is is not what they've what they've known, but how the the attitude and the 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 prior skill set can actually get them up to to be good at at the job within the information security, and that's um, things that really help us. Then it's the race of exposure. We talked, uh, as mentioned, we talk to developers, product owners, business people. Uh, we have a re we we are really kind of at the center, and we can really see how the organization evolves over time. Um, and uh, whilst we trying to not make the news ourselves, we really f f can see that we are actually influencing those decisions. We have really have a central role in uh, help steer the business in some directions. 
it's a diverse community. I think we have we've expanded the team, uh, my, my team from barely me plus another person to now seven to eight people. And we all have different backgrounds. We all come from different experience. And this is uh, something that, that, that is great. And I think that's one, something we want to, to expand further. And finally, I think that's, uh, and I can talk personally, is GFK has really, really helps people and invest in people to, to help them with their personal development. So I said, I was a regular security IT analyst. And over time, I've basically moved to manager and actually managing your team. Uh, and I think that's something we're looking at uh, and trying to foster this this um, this environment where people can actually spend time training themselves um, during the the normal working hours, uh, so they they can just be better at the job and have better skills um, to um, to face the problems we have to resolve. And on that note, I would like to thank you all very much, and I will hand over to Giovanna. Hello, uh, thank you, Jean-Yves, um, and uh, I'm up next, I guess. So um, at GFK, I'm a Scrum Master and Senior Agile Coach, and if I introduce myself to you like that, I expect that from many of you, the question would be, so what is it that you do? Um, the title is uh, uh, quite unclear for lots of people who do not work in technology, so let me spend a couple of minutes on agility and then we move on um, to my role in general. So uh, you will discover that in technology in general, agility is a hot but not so new concept uh, um, which describes the ability of an organization to renew itself, adapt, change quickly and pivot fast and succeed in a rapidly changing um, environment. And this essentially sets itself apart from um, the older way of doing work when you would do a very long plan and you would try to get this plan to um, develop over maybe two or three years. And this would be the timeline that it takes for a project to be fully, fully delivered. Um, with Agility, we are looking at much shorter timeline. And uh, um, yeah, it is not a concept that uh, lots of companies have interiorized and digested in full. And that is why there is a request for people like me to come and coach teams and the organization as a whole um, in terms of uh, um, what it means to be agile, what it means to work on very short timelines, what to do to keep teams happy and able to work in a fast pace and rapidly changing environment. If I were to summarize it in a very, very simple way, I would say that actually as a Scrum Master, I'm probably um, the person that connects the dots. Um, I work as a servant leader of teams and I'm a, the custodian also of best processes within a program in the organization. As a Scrum Master, your relationship to a team is very, very close. And in my opinion, that's also why this role is so interesting for uh, a community like yours, because it is um, very important to have a lot of soft skills. Um, to be successful as a Scrum Master, I think that the crucial thing to have is a lot of empathy. You really want to um, read people and understand where they're coming from and figure out what you can do to make their work more serene, more protected, um, feeling safe and you know increase uh, better communication. Um, you really want to... Um, work at close contact with people. And that means accepting to work with personalities, which may be hard or you know hard to deal with or easy to deal with, uh, accept that people come with problems and on the workplace that you may have to get to get your hands dirty and resolve. And also accept that people will create conflicts within the team, within the organization, and that you're going to be called to help out with those. Um, you also always want to get um, things to improve. You want to improve the mood, you want to improve the working culture, you want to improve the processes. You really have this drive for improvement. And you're also not afraid of conflict. As a Scrum Master, I generate conflict within the organization, pricking at those points for to say the work culture could be better here, our processes could be better here. So I have to be open to criticize um, the organization. And that obviously is not the easiest thing to do because uh, it will generate conflict internally. You also, I also have to remain open to conflicts within the team. Conflict instead, I not generate, but I need to strive to resolve. And uh, it takes a certain amount of resilience to do that. There's a certain resilience that as a Scrum Master, you really must have. And finally, 
you wouldn't be a successful Scrum Master without being very proactive. You really need to be aware that you need to have that self-starting ability of pushing on for those improvements. But moving on to uh, what comes uh, in terms of pathways, I intentionally haven't started my little bit of the presentation telling you what uh, my path to this job has been, because I recognize that today more than ever, the pathways to become a Scrum Master and Agile Coach are very, very diverse. And that's what makes it a particularly suitable position, I guess, uh, for a lot of you who may not have a very strong technical background. So. Let me speak for a very brief moment on how I got onto the job. I have got maybe the old school way of uh, becoming a Scrum Master and Agile Coach because I have direct experience of the technology I work around. So I have a degree in physics, so therefore very technical. I have extensive training in working with very advanced mathematics, for example, and I've also worked as a researcher. And that worked out to be a perfect combination to work in a company like GFK, where we do data analysis and data science in and out. And this is my area of focus within the company. The team I work with are, for the most part, a team of data scientists, a job that I understand quite well. Um, but I also think that you can get to this position with many other different backgrounds and paths. And mine is the old school uh, way of doing things. And nowadays, those opportunities are way more open. And I think that that's a very welcome change. Um, for example, if you have in indirect experience of the technology, but solid knowledge of the organization, so you are in an organization that does this, for example, software development or data science work uh, or even other types of uh, um, development, you could know well enough uh, the business that even without the direct experience, you could be a great fit. Um, and even just simpler experience, uh, um, working with teams of any nature already puts you further on um, in terms of skills and preparation to be effective as a Scrum Master. More than that, have you studied psychology or a field nearby psychology? Mm, people may want to hear from you because there is so much soft skills required in this job that I have met very successful Scrum Master that came from a psychology background. And training is obviously part of uh, um, a normal path for um, you know, a Scrum Master. There are plenty of courses out there. Some are cheap, some are expensive, some are academic. I am also a university lecturer and I teach in uh, Berlin a course to prepare agile coaches only is the first of its kind. And this also exists as a pathway into um, this kind of career. But yeah, training will help you establish yourself and get, you know, provide yourself with more credibility. But it's really a range of skills that get you there and training by itself will not make you a successful Scrum Master. Um, but if we move to the next slide, I want to um, really drill this into you. This is my only takeaway here for you all. There are lots of skills that you may already have to be very successful at this job. And it's just a matter of packaging them in the right way and write the right application to be able to land uh, your initial position. And even if you do not aim to become a Scrum Master in the long range, I think it would be good to package these skills uh, somehow in your applications because you may be required at some point to take a leadership position within the team and having these skills would help you nevertheless. For example, if you're good at organizing people and uh, you're a good listener and can talk to all sorts of people easily, you're already in a good position. These are things that uh, um, are not only desirable, are pretty much essential for a Scrum Master position. So maybe you are only a short qualification away from being able to say, hey, I think I can do this. Test me out on this job. Um, better yet, if you are not scared to generate conflict and resolve conflict for others, do you feel strong um, in the way that you, know, you present yourself to the organization and uh, uh, you're OK receiving negative feedback and elaborating it and improving situations? Awesome. These are rare skills. If you got them, you're already in a very good position. You're a self-starter. That is also essential. If you think that you can spot and analyze problems and start firing off uh, uh, those escalation uh, messages to say, hey, we really need better communication between these teams or we really need better processes, that's also a, um, a very good thing and something that it, it will give you strength and it will give you um, power to be a very good Scrum Master. So really, this is my main takeaway for you today. Um, 
the Scrum Master role is potentially the one where soft skills are the most important and valued um, assets within tech today. So if you have these, this is maybe a situation that you want to consider or look into at least. Um, finally, I wanted to mention what it is that uh, um, is in it for you. So if we move to the next slide, I just wanted to mention what it is that I want to get uh, from this career. And I'll be super frank. So I wanted a job where I didn't have to dress up, wear makeup, and was comfortable showing up with blue hair. Frankly, after the education I received, I could have easily gone and worked in banking. And uh, that wasn't the right environment for me if you see what I mean. I have showed up at work with blue hair, as well as pink hair, as well as purple hair, and many more. And I really appreciate the casual environment and being surrounded by like-minded people who think of, you know, in uh, um, all sorts of different ways and all contribute to these projects. But besides for uh, which hair color do you really gonna want to go for, the other benefits, in my opinion, include being rewarded for fighting to change stressful situation within the organization. Very often, this is something that nobody ever wants anybody to do. If there is a problem, we are at the dust under the carpet. Well, guess what? That's part of my job to make sure that that carpet is not there and all the dust gets raised into the air and we are actually fighting for change. And uh, that's really cool. And I think it's something that motivates me a lot at work uh, and uh, it is fantastic to be rewarded for it. Um, so yeah, this I think uh, is, is something that really de definitely gives me a lot of satisfaction. So if the lack of makeup and dress up and hair color are something that were my prerequisite, this is something that I very much see as a reward, something that allows me to go home at, at night thinking like, okay, I had a good day today because I read some problems that need to be fixed. That's pretty good. Um, and finally, this relates in particular to my role at GFK and it is related to um, what it is in the job. And there is current cutting edge technology and feeling part of the here and now, um, because there are lots of jobs where you're gonna be quite disconnected from the hot topics talked about in semi-scientific publications. And instead, it is pretty cool to be able to say that the work I do keeps me quite close to uh, machine learning and uh, uh, artificial intelligence, so to speak. Obviously, all the roles that you're going to meet today that GFK is presenting to you are required to make that happen. And uh, for me, it's quite good. Um, it brings you closer to um, a very good career progression later on because you have experienced those technology. And even if I do not have a 100% technical role today, I appreciate being close to these technical roles because it gives you a lot of opportunities for career progression and development. And yeah, um, that's another thing that makes me think uh, at night to think like, ah, I understand this because I've seen it at work uh, over many months and I understand how it works now. So yeah. Um, that uh, was my very brief introduction to the role of the uh, Scrum Master and Agile Coach. Um, and I think that I'm done with this, so I am therefore handing over to Vanina. Thank you, Giovanna. Hi, um, my name is Vanina and I'm a front-end developer at uh, GFK. And yes. As developers, we do provide solutions to problems people don't always know they have. Uh, but mainly what we do is uh, development for our um, colleagues and for the end clients that we have. I'm uh, working primarily with uh, JavaScript and I've also picked up a bit of other languages along the way. So in this line of work, the more you know, the better, essentially. So what do we do as a front-end developers in my team? Um, we develop solutions, we fix problems. Uh, we're mainly supporting our colleagues in delivering solutions to our clients through surveys, as you can see on the screen. Uh, we take care of uh, the look and feel of the surveys. We provide custom solutions for specific clients as they need them, uh, when they need them. And we also make sure that uh, our surveys are enjoyable to take. 
Uh, so regardless of whether you're a student who lives on their phone 24 seven, or if you're like my grandma who just started figuring out, figuring out uh, computers, uh, we provide the same look and feel and uh, the same functionality across all devices. And you may uh, wonder why that is important. Uh, for example, recently uh, we redesigned an old solution for one of our, our surveys uh, and we made it uh, easier for people to interact with and we uh, improved the solution visually and that in the end uh, increased the respondent satisfaction by over 90 percent in the end so when you do something like that and then you hear it has such a great impact the feeling is truly amazing um, aside from that we um, also develop applications internally for uh, our colleagues uh, for the needs of the business and we constantly get requests for uh, custom solutions for different uh, surveys and uh, so on so there there is always uh, something to do and always a few to create new things and practice your coding skills um, we do also have fun it's not always play um work 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 uh, we have uh, tournaments from time to time and some of them um, are actually uh, made by um or, or organized by Jean Yves and his team. Um, and these tournaments are a great way to test our skills, to see where we need to improve, uh, what else we need to learn, and also a fun way to blow off some steam. And in fact, on the next slide, I believe, uh, yes, you can see on the right here, this is a screenshot of an application that uh, we built for uh, one such uh, tournament. Um, we had roughly two days to create a functional interactive application and it, this was the end result. Actually, you only see a very small part of it, but it was uh, a good one. So, um, did I always know that I wanted to be a software developer? No, not really. Um, in fact, when I was uh, starting to decide what to study after high school, uh, this uh, career uh, path wasn't at all popular. So I went into civil engineering and I ended up working in a small company that was designing and building uh, rock climbing walls all over Europe. And it was an interesting job. I was on the designing part. Unfortunately, I could never see one of those walls actually built, but that's another story. So after about five years, I decided I wanted something else. And by that time, I had already been exposed to software development through friends and uh, acquaintances. And I found that it's something I like, I'd like to try. I wanted to see what it's about and I decided I will go study again after <laughs> several years of working. And this is where GFK came into my life. I quit my job at the designing company and I started an entry-level job in GFK. It wasn't uh, development because I still didn't have the skill, uh, skill set for that. Uh, but um, I had enough time to study and work and GFK also provided me with a lot of support and additional trainings when I needed them. And the greatest thing about uh, this company is that um, I had the perspective to grow into the direction of uh, front-end developer, uh, which if you start from scratch somewhere, uh, can be quite stressful, it could be a, a shock. And when I finally got the skills to 
try. I uh, was lucky enough to move into the company, so I already knew the lay of the land and there wasn't much of an adjustment um, for me. So that's how I landed on my job right now. I've been here for about uh, one and a half years and I'm, I'm far from an expert, but I, I got the support to get here and I have the support to continue growing, which is the important part. I have the opportunities from GFK. And I'm a bit shorter than everyone else. Uh, I don't know if it's for all developers or just me personally, but I don't like to speak much about myself out in front of others. Um, so to summarize today, um, if you take away anything from uh, my short presentation, strive for progress. Don't be afraid to move on to something better. Even if you're developing something and you see it's not working, just move on and find an employer who, in, who will invest in you. For me, this is key because um, if they're not willing to give you the opportunity to grow, this relationship is not going to end well. And if you wake up tomorrow and decide you want to do something else, something different, just go for it. It's um, it's not a scary thing to switch a career. Nothing is impossible. So that was me. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa. I work as a data scientist at GFK, and I'd like to show you what a data scientist is, what she's doing, and also how to become one. So therefore, let's start with my journey to become a data scientist when we go to the next slide. So I did my A-levels in 2012 in German, English, Biology, History, and Maths. Maths, not because I was super good at it, but because I had to here in Germany. So I was never very tech oriented or good with numbers. And I also didn't know what I would like to become. So which job I would like to do. And this is why I did a bachelor in socioeconomics, which is a mix of sociology, economics and some statistical modeling. So a rather broad field which can prepare you for many different jobs. But in 2016, I did an internship at GFK. And this was my first touch point with data science, and I liked it a lot um, because of the topics, the way of working, but also the colleagues and the working atmosphere there. So I stayed as a working student while I finished my master's degree, again in socioeconomics, but this time much more focused on statistics. And I even wrote my master's thesis in data science and finally joined GFK as a full-time employee in 2019 in the department Global Data Science. So when we go to the next slide, um, we can see data science is the extraction of knowledge from data. That can be big data, can be small data, covering many different topics, and the extraction can happen in various ways. This is one aspect that makes the job interesting. So it is very diverse and each project or topic has its own challenges. And also the people you find there have very different backgrounds and study different subjects, which in my opinion can lead to very successful teams. On the next slide, I collected some characteristics you might find on a typical job offer for a data scientist. Um, the hard skills are on the right hand side and the soft skills on the left hand side. So clearly a hard skill are the programming languages, um, then the statistical modeling skills, also data handling, sometimes cloud technologies or operational tools like Git, which we use in our day to day business. Um, and sometimes even domain knowledge is required. Don't be afraid or hesitate to apply to a job if you don't know all of these things. You can also learn them on your fly in your new job, especially things like Spark, Google Cloud Platform or Git. Um, on the other hand, we have the soft skills. So you should be eager to learn new things, basically your entire work life. Um, you should have an open mindset and be communicative with your team, but also with stakeholders and clients, as you might need to explain your daily work from time to time. 
um, you should be a team player. This is very important. So we work in interdisciplinary teams with people from all around, all around the globe, which makes the job even more interesting. Um, a structured way of working is helpful because the projects I was part of were usually large. So it's helpful to be able to break things down into smaller tasks and to be organized. And usually we work in agile teams, but also this is something that can be learned fast and on the fly. Now in the next slide, I'd like to deep dive more into my job at GFK and what I'm doing there. So GFK is a big market research company with a long history and GFK has a big retail panel. In a retail panel, we track the sale of products in various shops, online and offline, all around the globe. So we collect the data in more than 60 countries from over 620,000 stores and in our database are over 180 million products. And my job is to integrate the incoming data from all these stores into GFK's database. When we go to the next slide, we can see how we do this. So me and my team are supervising 54 different machine learning models, which do this integration as efficient as 65 humans. We have very strict accuracy and coverage expectations for these models. So the quality of the models is as good as possible. And we are on the critical path for client delivery. So this means our models run live in production and integrate the incoming data basically every minute. This is something we are very proud of because many people talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, but I hardly know anyone who managed to actually use these things in production successfully. And we, we do this for almost three years now. So how are we doing this? When being part of such a project, there are mainly two big topics you must deal with. First of all, maintain what is already there. And second, extend and improve the existing solution with new ideas. So to give you an example, I drafted a usual day, how a usual day would look like for me on the next slide. So my day starts at 9 a.m. And first of all, I look at some performance KPIs to monitor the quality of our models to see, for example, whether I find suspicious or bad performing data deliveries. And we do this with live dashboards. Our tool for that is Kibana. Then at 10, there is usually a team meeting where we think about the upcoming day and what we plan to achieve today. At 11, I might deep dive into the data. Therefore, I use our databases Elasticsearch or Mongo to follow up on something that I either spotted in the morning while monitoring the dashboards, or we got an external request from our stakeholders to verify the performance of a specific product, for example. Um, then after lunch, I continue with research. Here we write everything in Python. Um, good research questions for us are, for example, how to detect refurbished articles that are delivered to us, or can we extend our models to cover more products? Things like this. Um, we also do this in peer programming with either more junior or more senior team members. Then at three o'clock, I might have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with my chapter lead where we discuss my plans for the next year and how she can support me with this. And then at four, I wrap up my day by answering some emails and sharing some insights I gained through the day with the stakeholders and the team members. I do all this in the Department of Global Data Science at GFK. When we go to the next slide, you can see some characteristics of that department. So we have 70 colleagues there from 10 different nations at four different locations in Germany, UK, Poland and Spain. And we work in cross-functional teams. So meaning not only data science, but we also have a close collaboration with developers, SREs or machine learning engineers. Um, in general, there is to say that this department is very open and my boss always encouraged me to do something next to my regular job. And I tried all of these things I listed here on the right hand side, which was great fun. So, for example, there is the possibility to attend conferences, not only as a listener, but also as a contributor. Um, you can participate or even organize hackathons. We have lunch and learn sessions where people talk about their everyday projects. Uh, we also have a knowledge cafe. And of course, you are allowed 
to attend external and internal trainings. Um, I can also share all the GFK related links here in the chat so you can have a look around and I can also share my email and my LinkedIn so you can reach out to me if you have any questions. So what are the key takeaways from this talk? First of all, you can become a data scientist not only by studying data science, but also with many other backgrounds, which makes the job particularly interesting. Second, each data science position holds different tasks and challenges because the data is different and the way to extract the knowledge from it is always challenging. And third, GFK offers many possibilities to play on your strengths. And as I said, there are many ways to grow and to kick off your career in data science. And with that, I think I will hand over to the questions. Okay, that's great. Thanks so much, Lisa, for doing that. I'm just going to add everyone back onto the stream. We've got quite a few questions from the audience. Um, so for the rest of the audience who want to keep asking questions, feel free to do that. Um, and I will ask them to our panel one by one. Uh, right, guys. So the very first question that we do have um, is from Yasmin, um, and it's from Maddie. Uh, so do you, as a business analyst, create the prototypes or do you have a UX designer or someone else you work with who works on that? I think Maddie may just be having some technical difficulties for now, so we'll come back to that. Uh, let's go to John Eves. John Eves, um, did you have an interest in hacking before getting into your tech role or did that come afterwards thanks that that's a great question i think in my particular case it probably came afterwards um i, I pre got my first computer age 17 at the time where the internet was only just about taking off back in france so i was really not exposed to hacking or or computer science at the time i think what maybe uh helped me is i was been fairly curious about discovering new things and um uh and was had a bit of discipline that i've always kind of kept with me uh back in school and at university in terms of one thing i really liked was uh writing essays and how to formulate a problematic and how to reason uh, toward the solution and i think that's a methodology that i've always used and really helped me and i think it's extremely helpful in informatics when you start discovering those behaviors uh, I think, yeah, hacking came afterwards when I started actually really exploring different systems, working with different teams, uh, sometimes social engineering my way to understand what some teams were doing and understand the issues they might have. Uh, and, and yeah, it's, it, I think it's something that a skill that you can really develop by uh, being curious, always wanting to discover new things and developing, developing yourself. And yeah, having that curiosity is really important. All right. Thanks for that. Very cool. Um, for Giovanna, we have, how often do you face difficult conflicts? Also, if you believe you have the skills that are not from training, how would you be tested on this by an employer without them knowing you? Okay, so I'll start with the first question and how often do you face difficult conflicts? I think that the most difficult conflicts are the ones that arise within the team. Really what uh, someone like me, a Scrum Master or Agile Coach, will try to develop is that the team really becomes a tiny unit, a secondary family somehow. And it is really heartbreaking to see people starting to argue maybe for futile reasons, maybe for fundamental reasons within a team. And I would say that these uh, um, are what I would qualify as difficult conflict to deal with. But they do not arise very often. Let's say that, you know, you may be put in a situation having to resolve an internal team conflict one to three times a year. So not that often. By far more normal is for me somehow to generate conflict, which is to say, hey, the communication to the teams is not done properly. We need to step up uh, um, our team building activity within the company. And this is by far less uh, difficult to deal with. So in my book, okay, sure, I have experience, but um, I don't really qualify them as difficult conflicts. And this could arise on a weekly basis. You know, you raise some dust and you need to make sure that uh, that problem is addressed. But 
yeah, that's more or less the frequency, let's say, of how often you see conflicts. But conflict, I just would like to add, is not something that, you know, keep me up at night uh, or uh, um, really affect me psychologically. It is 100% part of my job. And I totally take it in my stride. And uh, um, yeah, you learn how to work through them. Um, in relation to uh, all of the skills that do not come from training and in terms of to be tested, they will test you, for example, at the interview stage. So when it came my time to be interviewed by GFK, um, I was flown over to the location from which I work in Germany. And uh, I was uh, in the office eight hours. And essentially, um, I was asked to perform some of the tasks that I would be performing after I got hired in the end. Um, and uh, yeah, you get evaluated by your peers. Uh, so other Scrum Master and Agile coaches that already have those skills and they will test you on those. Um, so they do not necessarily need to know you. Like any interview, you're not going to dig 100% deep into people just because there is no time or scope. But there is definitely a way to test people the same way that probably Vanina uh, and Jean Yves would test mm. their team members when they join. Um, it goes the same for Scrum Master and, and Agile coaches, more or less. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, let's go back to Maddie. Uh, so, Maddie, uh, this is the question um, Do you create the prototypes or do you have a UX designer or someone else you work with who works on that? Yeah, this is um, a great question, Yasmin. Just checking you can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, it can really depend on the company. Um, what we have right now is we do have UX designers. So let's say, for instance, you're working on a website and you need to create the login page. You have already done enough research to know what needs to be on that login page. And the developer also, you've told them in the requirements what needs to be on that login page but it is the designer's job still to tell you how that should look. You just need to tell them what it needs to consist of. So it's a really nice mix up where you work alongside them to help tell them what needs to be there, but you're not telling them how it needs to look. They've got their own guidelines and they have their own job. You're just really helping with the functionality and to tell the developer once, once you've told them what those requirements are, I need to see X, Y, and Z on that login page. And that's how you know that the task is done. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Yasmin for Vanina. How did you build up your skill set as a software developer? And what skills do you feel benefited you during your transition from your previous career? Uh, so I built up my skill set by at initially um, taking courses at the university. Um, and Later, I had some trainings uh, within GFK, which were a bit more work-oriented, but they were also uh, covering a lot of what I was studying at the university. So that was a lot of practice for me. And I'm still building it up, actually, by doing real work. And this, I have found, is uh, the best way to learn something is to actually work it. Um, so I'm, I'm still be building up my skill set, um, as we go. And what do you feel benefited you? Okay. So one thing that really benefited me from my previous career, this was, uh, my logical thinking. Um, this was important when designing climbing walls. You have to have some common sense, what goes where. And this type of thinking is also very applicable for uh, front-end development. All right. Thank you. Um, for Lisa, we have, what's the most exciting thing for you in this space? In, in, in which space? In your space. <laughs> <laughs> so in my job? Yeah. Okay. In the okay. fields, let's um, say in the data okay, science okay. fields. Um, so, so um, first of all, so uh, I mean, there are things that every day can be super exciting. So when I open up my emails in the morning and I see some requests, oh, can you please have a look at this and that? Um, something might not be working or something like that. So then it's directly jumping onto this 
dig deeper into the data, have a look around what's going on. Um, this is super exciting. Uh, but of course, I also have uh, great colleagues. Um, we can have a lot of fun there. So this is also super exciting. Um, then it's always cool when we bring something new to production. So when we finish the research phase and finally go to bring it live, so to say, um, then this is always exciting. What will happen next? Will it work exactly as we figured it out during research or uh, will something else happen? Yeah, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Great, thank you. We have another question for Giovanna. So this is um, from Privy, uh, who is a certified Scrum Master, um, but they're finding it difficult to get a role um, due to a lack of technical experience or being in a tech firm. Do you have any like suggestions that you would give? First of all, Purvi, if you are not aware, you've got a pretty advanced uh, certification. So uh, lots of people will start off with something um, much cheaper to acquire and uh, also much easier and faster to acquire. And instead, uh, you have gone for something that is really quite ha um, high up there. I know because I've got the same certification among a plethora of others. So I know that this is not an exam that is easy to pass. Um, so my recommendation here to anybody with uh, any certification but a lack of direct experience would be essentially to trying to find a different project where you can actually put those skills to good use. I'm assuming here that you do not have those skills at the moment. For example, I've suggested people to say, hey, you know, there are plenty of um, organizations out there that may need a hand on a volunteer basis for a couple of months. I referred someone to the Women's Institute in the UK that, you know, a specific chapter needed some help and they could test their uh, Scrum Master and Agile coaching role in that specific environment. And even if it's a volunteer opportunity, you get to test yourself in those skills. And that's something that already gives a little bit of flavor of the position to your CV, which goes beyond just the certification. So this is something that I would advise. Obviously, I am fully conscious that volunteering is uh, unpaid and not everybody's got the luxury to do it or the time, but I think that it could be an interesting route to uh, develop your skills and give you more clout uh, um, in that role. Um, also, I think that the building up some of the technical experience in other ways can be beneficial. Another traditional route to become a Scrum Master or Agile Coach is essentially to start with a different role and then finding out that you are servant leader of the team by far more than your team members. And then you are going to start taking that path. I've seen it happen many times at GFK and I've coached many of those um, that became junior Scrum Master and Agile Coaches. So that is another role that you can try in your current job. Um, so that's something else that uh, you can give uh, a try to. And it is true that uh, um, there are not a lot of positions for juniors. Um, often it is the case that for a Scrum Master, they want someone mid-level. And that mid-level is usually acquired saying, hey, I've got a couple of years experience while being a QA engineer or a tester, for example, a word that you've heard from Janiv earlier. And that can give you the opportunity of uh, um, essentially reaching a mid-level uh, position. But I would also like to say that, you know, junior positions do exist. Um, you're just going to have to probably prove yourself quite a little bit harder. And you're saying that you're finding it harder, which is not surprising to me in a way. Um, but they are, they are there. Um, so I think that you may miss a little bit of experience on the side, and then you should be good. All right, thank you. Uh, great. So this is a question to any or all of you. Um, and what would you say the work-life balance is like at GFK? Do you have to take a lot of work home to do in the evenings or weekends? Uh, Jean-Yves, do you want to start us off? Uh, yeah, I can. I might be not a good example because I'm <laughs> one of those who... Uh, I love what I'm doing, so it will be easy. It will be it's easy for me sometimes to actually uh, get stuck in and not actually watching time, and then I realize, oh, uh, the day is well gone, and I'm still online. Uh, one thing I'm actually repeating my team, uh, tell my team repeatedly, is actually do the work within your own time. 
um, ideally doing work, work, work life, w working hours and switch off afterwards. Um, I know in the past, in previous companies, one thing that happened a lot was, especially around training and uh, skills development, the employer would not give me the time to develop those skills during the work time hours because we had so many tasks. So I ended up doing a lot of extra work uh, outside of hours. And information security, because we're all so passionate about it, it is, it's often a choice that we, we would do research outside of hours because like, we, like, uh, we like what we do and we have side projects. But one thing I, I, I try to do and I tell my team to do is actually, no, uh, switch off. I don't want to have you, uh, we, we should not be working at weekends. Um, uh, if we, I mean, if there's, for us, SOC, uh, the SOC is a bit of a special case. They have, sh they have to cover 24 seven. So we, we do have actually shift work there, uh, but that's a different arrangement. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, if we can't do all the work during the, during the time, that's where we need to have a, a, a chat during our standups, prioritization. There's only so many hours we can do uh, if we can't do everything and we'll, we will never do everything in InfoSec because it's so busy. Uh, we just need to prioritize and ensure that we we, we get our people uh, the right uh, work-life balance. And I think having had GFK for the past three and a half years, it has actually, it, it's a company that's transformed a lot and has actually gone better in that area. So. All right. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else on the call who wants to share their insight on that? I will add that it is part of my role to force people to stick to working <laughs> hours and yeah. do never take work home uh, in the evenings mm. or weekend. So mm. if you work in an agile environment, you've got someone like me around, you will be lambasted if you try to take work <laughs> home or if I discover that you work past uh, working hours mm. or in the weekend. So in a way, companies today also try to protect you. The whole idea is that if you burn out, uh, you're going to end up on sick leave and that's going to, you know, not be great for your team and it's going to damage you and we want to keep you. Um, it's not the kind of environment where we try to squeeze people for all they've got 70 hours per week because it's counterproductive. And just one more thing on training. Uh, in my team and in the overall InfoSec, we have this bylaw that 10% of your time during the week is spent on training. And it doesn't matter what's going on. It is your time. You block it. And even I should not be bothering my guys what's doing that. Yeah, sounds good. Maddie, you wanted to add anything to this? Uh, yeah, um, just for the UK specifically is what I know, but um, we do have core hours as well, which are between uh, 10 in the morning and 4 o'clock. And so uh, as a company, GFK are very, very open in saying, we know that you have lives outside of work. You know, if you've got children to pick up, if you've got people to look after, they are totally comfortable with you having an arrangement with your manager to say, look, I need to sign on at 12 o'clock tonight because I'm too too busy this afternoon, you know, I've got to take the kids to the doctors. And they're happy to do that. And we are totally, totally comfortable with getting emails outside of office hours to understand that people can't always, always work between 10 and 4 because we do have lives outside of our careers. So it is a really good company in that sense that they are very flexible and just let you have the balance that you need. Excellent. Great. Uh, Vanina, we have a question for you. What do you think are the main skills and languages that someone should learn to be able to switch careers to be a front-end developer? So for me, for front-end developer, I would say automatically JavaScript. And then you would want to build up on that with uh, jQuery, with uh, Angular, with React, the more the better. Um, and you could look at other languages, of course. Uh, keep in mind, JavaScript gives you a lot of freedom, but with that comes a lot of uh, under, underwater stones, let's say. <laughs> because if something isn't working, you don't get automatically a clear view why it's not working. But it does, gives you, it does give you a lot of freedom, and it's for me, it's the best uh, language for front-end. Thank you. We have another question for all of you. Uh, so what is the attitude to hiring older women at GFK? What are your guys' thoughts on that? I'm happy to take this one. Um, I work on our UK um, diversity team and our tech diversity team too. So um, this is a topic that we take very seriously. 
we statistically in tech as an industry, we do struggle to hire more women. Um, the company ourselves, we are doing a lot to try and promote more women into tech. So we're doing a lot as well for um, women over the age of 40. Um, we're doing some menopause initiatives that we've got going on as well. That's the first time that we've ever done something like this. And we're also looking at things like returners policies. So people that are coming back from maternity uh, maternity leave, just to make sure that we make sure they feel included when they come back to GFK. So we are total advocates and we're just trying to put the right steps in place now to get more women in. Amazing. That's really, really good. Uh, another question for all of you is, so many of you started at GFK and have transitioned into different roles. Do you think the company and its culture has helped you to thrive where you may not have in another company? Free yes. for all. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Maybe I can say here definitely. Uh, so I started in a not really tech position and to move to a front-end developer as a junior, uh, it was much easier for me to do this uh, uh, in, internally in the company uh, rather than go find uh, a new job, uh, a new company and start over from scratch. So the... Culture in the company is definitely something that helps. Great. Anyone else want to add? Well, I was about to say yes, definitely as well. And I think, again, the culture has also evolved over the years. So when I joined, maybe the culture was quite different and might, might have been much more traditional organization, old fashioned. Uh, and now I think people are actually ready to take risk, actually give people chances and say, uh, please, can you, do you want to take responsibility of this and support you? And if you fail, uh, you fail fast, you, you learn from it, and uh, people are happy to support you to get back on your feet as well. Um, yeah, so I think it, it has become uh, much better on that front here. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And the final question for all of you, is what's the most important thing you would like our audience to take away from today? I can start. Um, so we'll start with this. Um, soft skills are important, are very important. Um, they will set you up uh, um, well for a transition into yeah. tech. Um, and uh, don't be afraid uh, to make those changes uh, and uh, hunt down whatever it is that you want from a career path mm -hmm. in technology. There, is lo there are lots of opportunities at all levels. It's an industry that is hiring a lot. It gives a lot more flexibility, for example, to work from home. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Amazing. Next person. Maybe I can... Okay, maybe I can go next. So um, don't be afraid to try something new, maybe also something that you thought that um, maybe you're not good at, maybe give it a second chance and have another look at it. Um, maybe you find some people who can help you with it to improve on that. Um, it's it's very important to, to also find a, a good employee, find a great team that will support you and yeah, give it a try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you have skills, uh, be confident about it. Show that because when people see skills, they will go for it. They yeah. will invest in you and they'll give you a chance. Great. Thank you, Maddie and Johnny. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Maddie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, for me, it's just very much... Don't get disheartened if you feel like you've not got the technical skills yet mm. and you feel that you need to start a bit further back. There's nothing wrong in going into a job and learning on the job because that's exactly what I've done and I've found a career path that I didn't think mm. I would ever go into. Um, mm. So if you see a job and if you like the company and the culture, that's so important. Get in there, get the, your foot in the door and then network and, and you'll grow and it's a great opportunity to grow. And it's much easier, actually, mm -hmm. once you're in there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, uh, I'll carry on on the theme. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to explore, discover. 
uh, and to ask for help uh, and be upfront as well uh, when you apply for jobs that you, you say, I might not have all the skills, I might not have the, all the knowledge, but I want to learn and I want to explore this further. Uh, and can you please help me into, uh, into getting to that point? I think if you're, if, you, if you're honest and transparent, good employers will actually take a shot on you and actually mm -hmm. really support you in your, in your discovery. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, thank you all so much for, you know, spending your evening tonight and sharing your insights with our audience. Quite a few have already said, you know, thank you so much. And a lot of them are hoping to transition um, into a tech career. I think there looks to be a slide from Erin. So uh, for the audience, if you want to scan that QR code, you can have a look at the current openings at GFK. I've also posted a link really early on in the YouTube chat on the careers website, which you can go have a look at as well um, to if you want to have a explore the opportunities that are there. Um, but apart from that, I'm going to end the broadcast. So thank you all audience for joining us so much. Hope to see you at the next one. Bye.